Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Euclidean domains. Okay, so, uh, we're in the process of discussing the Euclidean algorithm, and we're trying to understand why it is that this uh, final remainder that the Euclidean algorithm gives us at the end is actually going to be the greatest common divisor of the two starting elements of the Euclidean domain that we started with. Okay, right, uh, so, there is a nice case where you can easily conclude that an element is a greatest common divisor, and in fact our final remainder here is going to satisfy that case. So a nice easy case where you can conclude that an element is a greatest common divisor is if you can find a principal ideal that is equal to the ideal generated by A and B. Okay, so if it happens that this ideal generated by A and B, which is all combinations of a multiple of A added to a multiple of B, um, if you can find some element whose principal ideal is equal to this um, ideal generated by A and B, then you can be sure that that element, so if I write it like so, if we can find some, let's say, D, uh, which, when you generate its principal ideal, that principal ideal is equal to the ideal generated by A and B, then you can instantly conclude that that D is the greatest common divisor, or at least is one of the greatest common divisors of A and B. And the reason you can conclude that is that first it does satisfy the condition to be a common divisor. The ideal generated by A and B is contained within the principal ideal generated by D, because it doesn't have to be properly contained, it just has to be contained within it. They can be equal to one another, so that shows us that D is a common divisor. And more intuitively, of course, if A and B uh, are in the principal ideal generated by D, which they will be if uh, the ideal generated by A and B is equal to the principal ideal generated by D, then that of course means that both of these are going to be multiples of D, and therefore D does divide both of them, the definition of a common divisor. And why does it satisfy the greatest condition here? Well, if you have any other common divisor of both A and B, the ideal generated by this other common divisor must contain the ideal generated by A and B. And I do apologise, uh, that should be a and B there, not A and D. Okay, so replace that with A and B here. Okay, uh, so the ideal generated by A and B must be contained within the principal ideal generated by the other common divisor, and since that's equal to the ideal generated by this D, of course any other common divisor's principal ideal will have to contain this ideal generated by D, so D does indeed satisfy the greatest condition, so it will always be a greatest common divisor. Okay, so if you can find an element whose principal ideal is the same as the ideal generated by A and B, then you can instantly conclude that that's the greatest common divisor of A and B. Now, in Euclidean domains, we have shown that all the ideals are principal. Okay, so in particular, the ideal generated by A and B will be um, representable as the principal ideal of some element in the Euclidean domain. Okay, and I claim that, in fact, the ideal generated by A and B is equal to the principal ideal generated by Rn, and therefore we can instantly conclude that Rn is indeed um, a greatest common divisor of A and B. Okay, so, what we now need to prove then is this statement that the principal ideal generated by this final remainder that we end up with here in the Euclidean algorithm is equal to the ideal generated by A and B, and then we will have proven that Rn is indeed an example of a greatest common divisor of A and B. Bravo! Okay, and it's not too difficult at all. So if you want to prove that two sets are equal to one another, and remember this is just a set and this is just a set, if you want to prove that they're equal to one another, then the standard sort of approach to doing that is firstly proving uh, that they're contained in, well, containment one way around, and then prove containment the other way around. So let me just make this obvious by actually writing it down. Okay, uh, so one way that you can do this is by proving two things. So the first thing you need to prove is that the uh, ideal generated by A and B is contained within the principal ideal generated by Rn. And then the second thing you need to prove is that the uh, ideal generated by Rn, the principal ideal generated by Rn, is contained within the ideal generated by A and B. If you prove those two opposite containments, then you can instantly conclude that uh, they are both equal to one another. 
Okay, and that's the standard way of showing that two sets are equal to one another in pure mathematics. Okay, so we just need to prove these two easier statements than proving this. Okay, so let's start with number one. So we want to prove that the ideal generated by A and B is contained within the principal ideal generated by Rn. The way of doing that is simply to prove that A and B are in the principal ideal generated by Rn, because this is just the smallest ideal that can possibly contain A and B. Okay, the instant you put A and B into an ideal, all things of this that are in here, and I'll just write out explicitly what this set actually is equal to. So the, so the ideal generated by A and B is just everything of the form, and I'll use alpha 1 times A plus alpha 2 times B, where alpha 1 and alpha 2 here are allowed to vary over any element of the domain. Okay, so you let alpha 1 and alpha 2 vary over every single element of the domain, you calculate for every single combination you can possibly come up with this answer. You multiply alpha 1 with A and you add it on to alpha 2 times B. You calculate that answer in your domain, you stick the answer into this set, you collect absolutely every single one of those up, and that set, that is the ideal generated by A and B. And that amazingly is an ideal, and you will hopefully agree that as soon as you have A and B in an ideal, you have to to have everything of this form in the ideal because of the fact that the ideal is closed under multiplication and also closed under addition. Okay, uh, so you simply cannot have A and B in an ideal without having everything that's in this ideal in it. So the instant you put A and B in this principal ideal generated by Rn, it then implies that the entire ideal generated by A and B has to be uh, contained within the principal ideal generated by Rn. Sorry, Rn. Okay, so how then can we conclude that A and B are elements of the principal ideal generated by Rn? So basically what we need to show is that A and B are multiples of Rn, um, because that's what it means to be in the principal ideal generated by Rn, uh, that you're just some element of the domain, uh, the Euclidean domain, uh, multiplied by Rn. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, we go back to our picture of the Euclidean algorithm here. Look at the final line here. We have the Rn minus 1 is some multiple of Rn. So excellent, Rn minus 1 is a multiple of Rn. So Rn minus 1 is going to be within uh, my um, principal ideal generated by Rn. So that's excellent. I'm going to circle everything that's contained within the principal ideal generated by Rn in orange. Okay, so here's my principal ideal generated by Rn. And I've now concluded from the bottom line that Rn minus 1 was in my principal ideal generated by Rn. Now, go up a line, go to this line here. Rn is, of course, a multiple of Rn, it's 1 times Rn. And now what we know is that Rn minus 1 here is also a multiple of Rn. Okay, so what you can imagine doing is replacing in for Rn minus 1 here, this previous line, i.e. replacing Rn minus 1 with Qn plus 1 times Rn, i.e. it's a multiple of Rn. And then what you could do is factorise out, and I'll do this explicitly this, for this one here. So I would substitute in Qn plus 1 times Rn here for Rn minus 1. And then what you, I could do here is factorise out the Rn. And what I'd end up with is this. Rn minus 2 is equal to Qn here times Qn plus 1 from here plus 1 and then the entire thing times Rn. So what have I therefore managed to conclude? This is just some element of the uh, Euclidean domain here multiplied by Rn. So that means that Rn minus 2 here is also an element of my principal ideal generated by Rn. It is a multiple of uh, Rn. And then you can just continue this process on. If I draw the line that would be above this one, the line that would be above this one, I haven't really got space here, so I'll do it up here, would be Rn minus 3 here is equal to Qn minus 1, so just lowering all the indices by 1. Then I'll have Rn minus 2 plus Rn minus 1. Now we know that Rn minus 2 here and Rn minus 1 are just multiples of Rn. So just substitute in what multiple of Rn they are, and then factorise out the Rn, and then you'll get the Rn plus minus 3, rather, is a multiple of Rn.
and then you can just continue this process on back up the Euclidean algorithm here until you get to this one here and then you'd have that b is equal to q1 times r0 plus r1 and you would have concluded that r0 and r1 are multiples of rn so you could then uh, replace them with what multiple of rn they are factorize out the rn and you get that b is a multiple of rn and then you go up here and you'd replace b with a multiple of rn R0 as its multiple of Rn, and then you'd conclude that A was a multiple of Rn. So I hope I've convinced you there uh, from this little argument here that this can just continue on and on and on all the way back up. You can backtrack right the way back up to this line here and conclude that A and B are multiples of Rn, and therefore they are in the principal ideal generated by Rn, and the instant A and B are in the principal ideal generated by Rn, the entire ideal generated by A and B is in the principal ideal generated by Rn. So we can tick off this first line here. Okay, so excellent, we're halfway there. Next line, we want to prove that the principal ideal generated by Rn is contained within the ideal generated by A and B. Now, same trick as here. If we want to show that the entire principal ideal generated by Rn is in this ideal generated by A and B, all we need to actually do is show that Rn is an element of the ideal generated by A and B. Because the instant any element is in the ideal, is in an ideal, its entire principal ideal has to also be contained within that ideal because it has to be closed under multiplication. So multiplying this element by any element of the ring, you have to get something that's back in the ideal. That's equivalent to saying that the entire principal ideal generated by that element has to be contained within the ideal. So all I actually need to show is that this element, Rn, is an element of the ideal generated by A and B. Okay, so... I know what all of the things that are in the ideal generated by A and B look like. They look like a multiple of A plus a multiple of B. So all I need to show is that Rn here is a multiple of A plus a multiple of B. Okay, so I need to show that Rn is equal to alpha 1 times A plus alpha 2 times B for some alpha 1 and some alpha 2. So I just need to show that it's something of this form, and then I would have shown that Rn is in the ideal generated by A and B. So how am I going to do this? Well, to prove this one, to prove statement 1 here, I went up the Euclidean algorithm. To prove statement 2, I'm going to go down the Euclidean algorithm. So back to my picture of the Euclidean algorithm here. Start at the top here. Look at this, let's rearrange this. We could rearrange this into R0 is equal to A plus, and then it would be the additive inverse of Q0 times B, but that's the same as just the additive inverse of Q0 times B. Okay, because when you multiply B by the additive inverse of Q0, you get the additive inverse of Q0 times B. Okay, um, so I have successfully therefore written R0 as a nice combination of A and B, something times A plus something times B, okay? Yes, the thing in front of A is 1, but that's absolutely fine. Okay, so R0 is going to be in the ideal generated by A and B. And now we go on to the second line. So if R0 is in the ideal generated by A and B, what can I do now? I can substitute in for R0 here my... Um, combination of A and B, my multiple of A plus my multiple of B, and then take it on to the other side. So what I can do here, I'll put it up here, I can say that R1 now is going to be B here, and then it will be plus the additive inverse of Q1 again, and then I'll have that multiplied by R0 here, which will be A plus negative Q0 times B. And of course I can expand the brackets here and get that in the form a multiple of a plus a multiple of b. Okay, so overall it'll end up as, uh, so we'll have negative q1 times a from here, then we'll get quite a few in front of b, so we'll have plus, uh, we'll have the additive inverse of q1, so the additive inverse of q1 times the additive inverse of q0, plus 1 from here, and then brackets all the way around that, times b, like so. But that is still just some element of the ring. So my point is that I can now write r1 as a combination of multiples of a and b, basically. Okay, so that's from line 2, and then we can go down to line 3 here. Okay, we know that r0 
is a combination of multiples of a and b. We know that r1 is a combination of multiples of a and b, and so what we can do is rearrange it here to write uh, r2 then as a combination of multiples of a and b, and we can continue on all the way down to this final line here. We'll have that rm minus 1 can be written as a multiple of a plus a multiple of b, and then all we'll have to do is then uh, rearrange this to get rn here as a multiple of a and b. Oh, sorry, no, you won't You won't do it from that one. You'll do it from this one here. Well, you could do it from that one, of course, but you'd do it most likely from this one here. You wouldn't actually need to go on to that one to work that out. You could do it from here. You'd have the Rn minus 2 and Rn minus 1 here uh, were... Uh, and multi we're of this form, a multiple of a plus a multiple of b, move this one onto the other side and you then get that rn is a multiple of a plus a multiple of b. And therefore you could conclude therefore that rn was in the ideal generated by a and b, and the instant rn is in that ideal generated by a and b, the entire principal ideal generated by rn has to be contained within the ideal generated by a and b. Okay, so what we can therefore conclude is that indeed the ideal generated by A and B is equal to the ideal generated by Rn. Okay, so just by studying the Euclidean algorithm we can conclude that the ideal generated by A and B is equal to the ideal generated by Rn, this final remainder that we get in the Euclidean algorithm. So let me uh, make this utterly apparent by going back to my example here. Uh, my final Rn in this case was 18, so the principal ideal generated by 18 will be the same as the ideal generated by 342 and 126, okay, in the ring of integers of course. Right, and that now allows you to conclude that the ideal generated by Rn, the principal ideal generated by Rn, um, this Rn is indeed the greatest common divisor, basically, okay? Uh, well, an example of a greatest common divisor, because indeed it does obey the criterion for being a common divisor, which is the ideal generated by A and B must be contained within um, the principal ideal generated by the common divisor, uh, and it does indeed satisfy this greatest criterion because any other common divisor of A and B will absolutely have to have um, the principal ideal generated by Rn contained within its principal ideal because its principal ideal will always have to contain uh, the ideal generated by A and B, otherwise it wouldn't be a common divisor, so it therefore will always contain the ideal generated by Rn. So we're filling in for little d here, Rn. Okay, so the Euclidean algorithm then, it allows you to find greatest common divisors of two elements, A and B, which you pick from your Euclidean domain, and I will stress it can be applied to whichever Euclidean domain that you are working with. It doesn't just apply to the integers, although that was of course the example that Euclid had in mind when he came up with it. Okay, uh, so with that then we will finish this discussion of Euclidean domains.